moving higher to the tune of around maybe of half a percent or so at this stage here. We've got a big Fed panel today. J.P. Morgan Asset Management's David Kelly, Mona Mahajan with Edward Jones, also John Bellows with Western Asset Management Company, WAMCO as we used to call it back in the day. Uh, thanks everyone for being here as part of this program. Uh, let's start perhaps Mona Mahajan with you with just the expectations that you have from an investment strategy standpoint on whether people need to do anything with their money in the wake of what we're going to get from the Fed today. Yeah, you know, look, it's a great point. I don't think uh, necessarily we need to move money before or after this Fed meeting. But what will we what we will be watching for, of course, is that dot plot. And really what we're looking for is to see if the markets and the Fed are converging towards the same terminal rate. So right now markets are expecting this five, five and a quarter percent terminal rate. If the Fed kind of implicitly uh, uh, blesses that level, you know, we see a dot plot that also um, leads to a five, five and a quarter percent terminal rate. That, in fact, may provide the market a bit of comfort that um, we are closer to the end of this Fed tightening cycle. But also, perhaps after that, we'll get this pause. And then what will be really interesting to see is if they start putting in any sort of rate cuts for 2024 and beyond. And we think the markets um, will really look forward to uh, when the Fed may not only pause, but move rates lower once again. And that will really stimulate the market uh, rebound. But generally speaking, we think we're towards the end of potentially this bear market. Uh, any volatility in the months ahead will provide that opportunity to position for what we think will be a better market backdrop and potential recovery in 2024. John, uh, the market right now is pricing in a certain expectation. And we got a little bit of a movement, if you will, in some of those Fed fund futures and in the interest rate markets, given what we saw with the consumer price index, softer than expected this this past week here, just yesterday. I wonder, do you in your mind feel as though the markets are appropriately positioned? In other words, are the expectations correct for that so-called ending of the Fed cycle with a terminal or ending rate in that kind of, we'll call it four and three quarters percent at this stage? You know, I think you're right. CPI yesterday was important. And I think it was important for two reasons. Um, you know, the first is that I think the Fed is moving towards a more forward looking policy. Uh, over the summer and through the early fall, they were just reacting. CPI was too high and they were constantly on their back foot and reacting to those numbers. You know, reactive policy is problematic. You know, looking in the rearview mirror is, is not the best way to do policy. And the Fed is very happy to finally be more forward looking. And so I think CPI yesterday and also the month before is going to allow them to be more forward looking uh, in their policy. I think you're going to hear that from Powell today. And I think that's generally a very positive thing. I think the other thing that's important about CPI yesterday is after today's hike, it'll be the case that the policy rate will likely be higher than the run rate for core inflation. Uh, that's the first time all year that's been true. Um, and I think the Fed is going to look at that and have a little bit more confidence that policy is restrictive. You know, CPI may still be too high, although I think that's debatable. But with a policy rate that's now higher than the run rate of core inflation, it becomes just a matter of time before inflation starts coming down. And I think that's another big development. So I think generally speaking, you know, CPI yesterday was a big deal because it kind of enforces both those points. The Fed can be more forward looking. And now after today's hike, we have a policy rate above the inflation rate. And that's a big development and important for forward looking expectations. All right. And David, we've just got a few moments here left before the decision comes out. You've seen a lot of these decisions before this year. The numbers suggest that there's been a lot more volatility around Fed rate decisions with the markets. Do you expect that today? Not really. I think I think people are priced in 50 basis points. I think the dot plot will go up 25 basis points, but still a terminal rate of 475 to 5 percent. I think Jay Powell will actually smile during his press conference because there is better news on inflation. I think you'll have to admit it. That opens the window a little wider for soft landing. So I think this is I think we're in a good place here. And I think market expectations and the Fed's view are, are converging here. And I think that's a positive. All right. There's the 10 year yield. Three point five one percent. Let's call it ahead of the Fed decision uh, with WTI oil up two and a half percent. The S&P up about three quarters of one percent. And let's get to Steve Leisman with the Fed decision. Steve. The Federal Reserve raising interest rates by 50 basis points to a new range of four and a quarter to four and a half percent as expected. The Fed saying ongoing rate hikes will be appropriate. The Fed also raising the 2023 median forecast of Fed officials went up 
to 5.1%. It had been at 4.6%. This is higher than market expectations for a peak funds rate. Um, it is, by the way, right in line with the Fed survey at 5.15. 17 of the 19 officials are now above 5% in their forecast for the 2023 funds rate. None were above 5 in the September forecast. Seven officials, in fact, are at 540. And there's one person who's at 563 for the, all, all the way through 2025. The funds rate then seen going, going down to 4.1% in 2024, 3.1% in 2025, with a long run rate eventually being reached of 2.5%. The Fed repeats it will take account of the cumulative effect of rate hikes and lags in setting policy. This is again from the statement. It will continue to reduce the balance sheet by $95 billion a month. It says growth has been modest, inflation elevated, unemployment low, and job gains robust. So it still sees that tight job market out there. It raised the GDP this year to 0.5 from 0.2. That's because of the strength we've seen in the fourth quarter. But it lowered it to just a half a point for next year from 1.2. Ratcheted up a bit the unemployment rate to 4.6 from 4.4 for next year. Uh, stays there for two years, by the way. And it sees inflation gradually dec declining to 2% by 2025. So 50 basis points, Kelly, but pretty hawkish when it comes to the outlook. And good unanimity, by the way, the statement, the uh, 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 policy decision was unanimous. Good unanimity also, at least by the board right now, on where rates are headed, and that is above 5%. Hawkish, Steve, is the conclusion from markets where we've seen stocks lose all Should of their be. gains, in some cases turn negative, and a 10-year yield up about three and a half basis points. Again, this is the first reaction. It's going to be a long afternoon. We have maybe two hours until we're done hearing from Powell. That said, what's the most hawkish thing about this to you? Is it those rate hike projections, the dots as we call them, uh, especially into next year in 2024? So there's a discussion that I think we can have, Kelly, maybe in one of our your regular terrific uh, one o'clock shows, not the special, about whether the Fed is now using the uh, out the uh, dots as more of a policy tool. Um, and I think the Fed's sending a message here that while the market has taken all of this very dovishly, t uh, loosened up financial conditions, that part of this is a message, hey, we're going above 5%. We intend to be very tough here when it comes to inflation. So that 5.1%, not just by itself, but the number of people, the change from the September survey, uh, those n none of them were above 5% before, and many of them now being above, what did I say here? 17 officials now above five, seven officials are at 540 or higher. So there was a pretty hawkish, sizably hawkish contingent on the Federal Reserve right now. It sure sounds like the consensus, so to speak, is changing around that, Steve. All right, so stick around, please. We're going to talk with you a lot more, I'm sure, about this. Let's bring in our panel as well. Again, we've got a, a lot of folks out there, uh, and let's bring in and introduce Bob Pisani as well. Also, Rick Santelli joins the conversation. So this group, as you can see in front of you here, has a lot of expertise, and, and maybe we'll send it out to Rick first with some of the reaction on the interest rate and macro side of things. It wasn't a, a, a for sure, Rick. It was definitely movement in the marketplace, but it was nothing that was I would characterize as being unexpected or out of the ordinary. Markets did move, but not by a whole heck of a lot. No, and when you set the table for interest rates, to give some context, they have been moving rather dramatically lower considering the Fed's path. And today we see that two-year notes spiked up. They spiked up towards 426-ish, and, and they're coming back down a bit, but they're a little more sticky than 10s, which popped up to right under 355, came back down a bit. These are not huge moves, and in the context of the fact that we're even near 350 uh, after having a four and a quarter high yield close for 10s, or 470 high yield close for two year, and now hovering at what, 422, 423? These rates are low, and when you look at dot plots and how far out they're predicting inflation's going to be stubborn, something isn't squaring here. And it's going to be interesting to hear the Q&A because the markets have definitely become very opinionated and investors are pushing back more in the treasuries than they are in equities. Yes, the equity knee-jerk reaction was down, but it wasn't huge. And if you look at the spreads, twos to tens inverted to several basis points more, and the dollar index improved a bit. Uh, that latter, I think the dollar index will be a good tell during the Q&A. And we go to Bob Bassani for more on these stock moves that we're seeing. Bob, what do you make of it? Well, I think Dom's got it right. Uh, we were down about 300 point peak to trough uh, in the few minutes after the Fed announcement came back. Uh, and we're now flattish, essentially, on the Dow. So 
the market has been looking to break out of 4,100 on the S&P. Why? Because that would break the downtrend, this pattern of lower lows and lower highs we've had all year. But we've had a lot of resistance there. We failed several times. We had a strong PPI last week. We went to 3,900. So the hope here is you either break out above 4,100 or you grind around at 3,900 or so because that seems to be where there's a lot of support. And it looks like grinding around might be the thing to do at this point. The, the real problem here is Wall Street is dramatically lowering the earnings estimates for 2023 because inflation is a 2022 story. Recession is the 2023 story. What side of the recession debate are you on? And most major strategists now anticipate flat to negative earnings. Zero to down 10 percent is the range of the estimates for strategists on Wall Street. The average is about down 5 percent. So it's this is the problem. How do you argue for higher stock prices from here when you're in the middle of what Wall Street thinks is going to be a fairly mild earnings re recession? Let's put it this way. Down 5 percent on earnings would be a mild earnings recession down 20 percent would be a harder landing in terms of recession but how do you argue the s&p should be higher six months from now or even eight months from now when you're potentially down six to ten percent on earnings in 2023 that's a, a a hard case to make right now you'd have to argue for a, a multiple expansion and dom knows perfectly well that's a pretty thing to argue pretty hard thing to argue in a, a, a downward trending economic environment. You know, Bob, it, it's it's an excellent point and one that, that many traders have been talking about for, for maybe weeks now at this point is to see whether there is that kind of a breakout. This data, this Fed rate decision did not do anything to change anything from that trend standpoint. David Kelly, I, I'd like to bring you and the, and, the, and the rest of the panel back into the discussion here. David, the, the markets are reacting, no doubt about it, and, and equities are softer. They've moved to the downside. We've seen rates spike higher. But it all in the context of where we've been over the last several weeks seems as though the markets were kind of anticipating this. What does this then say about the way that the landscape sets up for the early part of 2023 and whether the Fed will continue its rate hike campaign, albeit perhaps at a slower pace, or for a little bit longer than it did, but with smaller increments? Well, I think the market was anticipating something more dovish in the dots than we've got, we've got here. Because if you look at the Fed Funds futures market as of this morning, it was looking at a terminal rate between 475 and 5, not between 5 and 5 and a quarter. Uh, but what I think is really interesting is, in some ways, the Fed is more hawkish than that. Because what they're saying is that by the end of the year, they'll still be between 5 and 5 and a quarter at the end of 2023. And as of this morning, futures markets were pricing in the idea that the Fed is already going too far and will have to cut rates twice at the end of this year. So I think there's going to be a, a major argument here sort of between the Fed and the markets where the markets are saying you're overdoing it. You're going to put this economy into recession here. And that's why you're going to end, end up having to reverse course. Um, so I do think it, it, it I think this is a mistake. I think the Fed is, is trying to be hawkish to you know show how resolute they are against inflation, but inflation's fading anyway. And it's not worth putting the economy into recession just to hit your inflation target, uh, you know, a, a year earlier than you, you thought you were going to. Inflation's coming down anyway. Uh, so I'm, I'm disappointed by this, but I think this is more hawkish than markets uh, expected. Although John Bellows, let's remember how um, dovish the dots turned out to be coming into this year and how wildly they underestimated the actual trajectory of inflation and rate hikes. So could we live through an episode like that again, to David's point, where the Fed does come around to the markets? If anything, the dots are one of the most lagging indicators that we have. Yeah, I, I think you're on a good point. I, there certainly is a little bit of a dissonance between the dots and the market. But the thing I would emphasize is that the degree of that is much smaller than it has been, um, and certainly much smaller than the volatility that we've realized in the market you know, over the last nine months. So we've been in a market where the surprises have been very large and the Fed surprises have been even larger, um, and that's been really challenging. It's been challenging for equities, it's been challenging for bonds. And as we progress, you know, we're getting closer to the point where there is a convergence. Um, there is a little bit more clarity on the outlook. I think Powell in his press conference is gonna talk a lot about kind of his forward-looking expectations. Um, and we're going to see less volatility as a consequence, and I think that's generally a good thing. So the thing I would emphasize here is there's a little bit of dissonance left, but it's a degree smaller, multiple degrees smaller uh, than the volatility we've experienced. And that, that's a big transition, um, and it's a transition that I think will generally be supportive of financial markets, you know, some resolution of the uncertainty, some convergence, um, you know, and that forward-looking policy that I said earlier, I think that's generally a good thing, and I think that's where we're headed. All right, so viewers, an update for you guys right now and those listening on SiriusXM Channel 112. Markets are at session lows. The Nasdaq Composite is off 
almost 100 points. The S&P is down about 27, 28 handles. Call it that, that just kind of, so to speak. Yeah, I'm ch- checking it right now. Now about about 20. So half of 1% declines. The Dow is now down 165, 170 some points. Uh, Mona, this is a good time to bring you back into the conversation here as well. We started you off with kind of the macro picture and what the expectations were. The way that the markets are shaping up right now seems to indicate at least that the initial part of next year could be a little bit more, say, biased to the downside, but maybe not as volatilely so as it's been. If you stack things up with the data that we've seen today from the Fed and the CPIs and the PPIs and everything else, does this then still mean that the path of least resistance for stocks is lower? Do we test the lows? Do we set new ones here in early 2023? Yeah, it's a great point. And look, I think uh, to John's point earlier, we are headed towards a 5% plus terminal rate, according to today's dot plot. But really, the market wasn't too far off of that. And so 5% or so means probably two more 25 basis point rate hikes. Uh, Maybe the Fed is giving itself some room in case inflation does become more volatile. But I also agree with David that inflation is starting to show signs of rolling over. And there are several leading indicators that we follow that do indicate that inflation... This episode is brought to you by Fairdesk, a crypto derivatives trading platform founded by six former Binance execs and three former Morgan Stanley architects. Fairdesk is a company focused on building a platform that enables traders to profit from both rising and falling markets. Sign up today and CB will credit you up to $600 in trading funds. For more information, visit Fairdesk.com. Link in the description below. For running your job, yeah. if it ain't about the dollars, then it don't make sense. Don't Got me sipping brown water, but it ain't from flint. Trying to chase all this bread, though the shit won't last. About to shut the shit down, like a cook that trash. Stacking my corn, stacking my corn, stacking my corn. Fuck it! Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Okay. Ready? Right. Fucking thing sucks! Okay. We'll do it live. Okay. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are doing it live, baby. Hope everyone's doing well. Another off the chain episode 90. 
Yes, 90, and we got Jerome throwing up the foes. I don't know what that means. What is that the Illuminati sign? Or you guys got to let me know. Anyway, make sure you guys hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you're new, because boy, this is like channel like none other. I tell you that much right here. We give it to you raw, and you know Crypto Blood, aka Crypto Domus, is always. I'm, well, I'm not doing this. I'm, I'm definitely not doing this. <laughs> I'm not doing this. I'm, I'm hitting them, boy. My predictions, Crypto Domus. The hit rate is is up there, ladies and gents. It is most definitely up there. But I want you to uh, first, before we get started, you know what time it is. I need you to get on that stage. All right, smack Chris Rock in a slow motion fashion like that. Make sure you rotate that wrist. Yes, get on the stage. Smack that thumbs up for me. 41 people in the building. It is greatly appreciated. I like what Daddy O said here. Only difference between Washington and Wall Street is 203 miles. You ain't lying, bro. You are not lying. The Smith crew said fourth quarter. Okay. Yeah, that, <laughs> I can go with that. The game is almost over. The jig is up, huh? Is that what he's saying? Possibly, man. Who, who knows? Who knows? But again... Guys, welcome to another episode of Off the Chain, and that is episode 90. Let's give a round of applause for that real quick, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, that's not the wrong, that's the wrong time. So, uh, Wu asked me if we were going to look at the trades. Now, we will. I don't know if we'll have time. We, we got time, because I'm going to go back to CNBC at 2.30. So... I'll try to take a look at those trades right now. Okay, blood, give us the alpha. What just happened? An impact moving forward. Okay, so I really want to hold my tongue until we see what Jerome Powell says, okay? But from what I'm seeing, terminal rate has increased a bit, meaning where they're going to stop has ticked up a bit. It's at 5.1% now. So that means they're gonna they're gonna stay raising rates longer than the markets predict or felt like they were. That's what I'm taking so far, but we definitely need to see what uh, Jerome Powell says on the, at the speech. You know, he's gonna do his double speak. We already know that. We already know. Juan says, looks like everyone at FTX hearing all agree we need regulations ASAP. We already got regulation. That's the problem. There, we don't need more. <laughs> we don't need more regulation. We suing compound, y'all. Get in on the class action. Okay, what's going on with compound? What's going on with compound? Let me know. But yeah, so I, I want to hold my tongue for after the Jerome Powell uh, podium speech. I uh, hope he brought his sodium while he had the podium. But uh, yeah, we'll wait for that and see what he has to say. Then I'll fully give you my two satoshis and analysis on the situation but i will give you this though uh yeah this chart right here let me see if i have it up here i don't have it up so let me get it up <clears throat> this chart right here is the my two satoshi chart that i always give you guys updates on and that was a pretty big move down. I mean, we were doing very well. We got above that trend line yesterday. Uh, we are currently, if I bring up the Crypto Blood, Bloodalytics charts, which you guys can sign up at bloodalytics.com. If you guys are interested in that service, I do have a lifetime service now available. Three month, six month, and 12 month. And if you do want to save 50 percent okay you can get 50 percent off the six or 12 month if you sign up with the link in the description below deposit at least a minimum of a thousand dollars you should probably do a little bit more than that but a minimum of a thousand dollars and i will generate you a promo code you just got to email me or send me a message on telegram i will generate you a promo code for 50 percent off the six month right here or 12 months subscriptions all right but again uh as far as the bloodalytics goes we took profit twice 
all right we took 50% off here at the peak there another 50% off here and that was today yesterday we took 50% so we've been in a long guy since middle of yesterday about actually yesterday morning 5 30 yesterday morning we went long on Bitcoin so we've got locked in all those gains we're Gucci right now so at this point if we do a full reversal which it looks like we're about to go short here soon the background is turning red which means we're getting into that short zone on here all right so let me uh someone saying the background music is echoing so let me bring that down a little bit there we go so yeah that's where we are currently with the uh bitcoin trades on the cusp of going short but we did take a lot of profits off the table now with ethereum I will, it was interesting with ethereum because it started to move way before bitcoin to the downside and at a bigger clip as well if you take a look at the move down i mean you're talking about a three percent move within 13 minutes which is huge so we're uh we did bounce off of this level right here oh wrong wrong tool wrong tool let's get this one out we bounced off of this level right here if i just draw a line well that's not a great line let's try that again buddy come on now let's get it together you draw that line across like that that's where we bounced off of but i you know again it you never know with these markets i tell people all the time the best thing probably to do is just not trade because you're probably going to lose money before you make money and if you're not persistent in trading the different directions that the markets may gyrate uh nine times out of ten you're going to give up before the true trend manifests in the market on these types of fundamental news plays so i just suggest for most to just not trade or take take all your trades off the table how about that but you know i trade i don't know about you but i do definitely trade through it so that is where we are uh, i'm expecting to go short but we gotta see what powell says he may shock us with something crazy guys who freaking knows Kenton Smith says, so 50% was expected and still a dump due to terminal rate going higher. Exactly. That's my that's my thesis on that, Kenton Smith. Yep. If you bought compound in the last 10 months, you're eligible to join a class action lawsuit. Lawsuit is over manipulation of price from 800 to 40. Is that a manipulation or just uh, <laughs> a bear market? Voice crypto? I mean, come on now. Come on, what, what manipulation was there? That's how you know you're in the thick of it. You're in the thick of the bear market, guys. When you see people, the lawsuits start coming out. That's when you know you're right in the middle of that, that bear market, guys. Let's go ahead and get this person out of here. Yes, sir. Roll that wick up to 183 blood analytics is the shiz. Thank you. Yeah, woo, I forgot woo, woo is in the blood analytics membership. Yeah, man, and listen, Wu, last night I was up late working on integrating the alpha system, the bonus system, into the chat room. I have a new chat room set up. It is all ready to go. I'm just letting it uh, do a few alerts, but you guys will have access to the alpha system tonight. Yes, tonight. -ta. Tonight. -ta. Actually, let me show you the trades on the alpha system. Because it is a little or a lot more, how can I put this? It is a lot more uh, precise, if you will. So let me see if I can pull that up for us. Give me a second, guys. Try to pull this up. I got the wrong one up right now. So I'll pull that up here in a second. So you guys can check out the alpha system. Okay, I think I got it now. Just pull that up really quickly. Bada boom, bada bang. We got about five minutes. We got about five minutes until. Now, see, this doesn't really do its justice, but uh, I don't know if I'm showing my screen or not. So let me just make sure I am. I am not. Yes, sir. Mind your business. <laughs> 
Mind Your Biz says, is this a cup or can of your bay mate? It is, my friend. This is some good stuff. You, let me tell you. This thing will have you up for days. And it's all natural. So. Rico said he went short because he heard everyone talking about the bottom is in. All oh, week, Mark is 10 to... <laughs> I hear that, man. I hear that. We got D-Born D in the... Uh, I was going to say D-Horn. Sorry, D-Born. D-Born in the building. Thank you for tuning in, my friend. So, as you guys heard, uh, 50 50 percent or 50 ba basis point rate uh, cut um, or hike. That's that was that was what the market was looking for. Unfortunately, the market also got an a slight tick up in the terminal rate, meaning where they're going to end their projection on when they're going to end their increase, and that was something the markets did not like. Did not like at all. Uh, I think we're going back to zero interest rates, so bull market is back on. Yeah, we will go. We definitely will go back to zero interest rates, but I don't think anytime soon. I'm going to be honest with you. I just don't see it happening anytime soon. So, <clears throat> And by the time it happens, back to zero, we probably will be in a scenario where we're in a deep recession or depression. So it will even out like it won't be a, a straight bull rally, in my opinion. It'll be like to save us from going even lower. That's that's what the scenario I see a zero interest rate environment uh, us being back in that. So it is what it is. But let me tell you, uh, show you some of the uh, alpha system signals. Now, it again, I'm going to try to change this. Because it doesn't do us any justice. And I don't really even know if I can give you anything that will show you the proper. Because we went short on Bitcoin here. Because it's a line chart and, and the alpha system doesn't work on time sequence. So it's, it doesn't do bar for bar. So I had to map this uh, Bitcoin price based on the line chart. And you'll see gaps. Because again, it doesn't chart it based on tick for tick, you know, or bar for bar. Uh, this being a 13 minute bar. So we really went short here at around 1351, which would be uh, right here on the, on the chart. Uh, when we had it lower, that's when we went short. We got the signal from the alpha uh signal to go short right on that long candle so <clears throat> this would have been a good indicator for you to sell more of your long that we were in from the actual bloodalytic system so as i stated i did a video about it. if you guys missed it go check it out explaining the alpha system it's in it's in alpha that's literally why it's called alpha system so it's not ready for prime time but it is a good way and i've been using it to uh, take profits and in uh, in long positions or take or cover on short positions so it is what it is but we're gonna go ahead and get back to Jerome Powell CNBC and I'll come back to you guys here in a little bit all right let's get it Cracking. People are maybe going to be able to gain some comfort that inflation does have some downside momentum and therefore, you know, the Fed may not have to go as far as they uh, as they thought or maybe growth can be more resilient. So I think that every data point is going to be filtered through, you know, this uh, set of expectations that the Fed committee has put out there. Uh, and look, we've absorbed a lot. You know, the, the stock market's in the same place it was when the Fed funds rate was at 0.75%. Back in the spring. So it's not as if every tick in what the Fed funds rate does uh, immediately takes value out of the market. It's all about how we're getting there and how much longer we have to wait till the end. And we've just got a couple seconds left. What's the one thing you'd be watching for in the press conference, Mike? Uh, I, I would say uh, he's going to say we're not done. He's going to talk about higher for longer. And uh, he did say and see if he actually gives a nod to the CPI data we got yesterday and is willing to exclude the rent calculations from uh, inflation uh, expectations. In other words, to try and say maybe now finally it's time for a more nuanced view of inflation. Whereas earlier this year he said we can't do that. 
Let's get a quick look at the market as we wait to hear from the Fed chair. The Nasdaq's down about eight tenths of a percent, as you can see right now. The Dow, less than that, interestingly, down about four tenths of one percent. And crude oil still hanging on to its gains with WTI up about two and a half percent. We saw a pop in bond yields, Dom, as well. Uh, immediately after the decision came out, up about three and a half basis points on the 10 year. And there we still are sitting right around those levels, around 354. All right. And what we have right now, you can see right there on your screen, Fed Chair Jay Powell approaching the podium right now. So we'll take you to his comments live right now. Oh, uh, here we go. Good afternoon. Double speak incoming right now. Before I go into the details of today's meeting, I'd like to underscore for the American people that we understand the hardship that high inflation is causing and that we are strongly committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal. Over the course of the year, we've taken forceful actions to tighten the stance of monetary policy. We've covered a lot of ground and the full effects of our rapid tightening so far are yet to be felt. Even so, we have more work to do. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve and serves as the bedrock of our economy. Without price stability, the economy doesn't work for anyone. In particular, without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. Today, the FOMC raised our policy interest rate by a half percentage point. We continue to anticipate that ongoing increases will be appropriate in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2% over time. In addition, we're continuing the process of significantly reducing the size of our balance sheet. Restoring price stability will likely require maintaining a restrictive policy stance for some time. I'll have more to say about today's monetary policy actions after briefly reviewing economic developments. The U.S. economy has slowed significantly from last year's rapid pace. Although real GDP rose at a pace of 2.9% last quarter, it is roughly unchanged through the first three quarters of this year. Recent indicators point to modest growth of spending and production this quarter. Growth in consumer spending has slowed from last year's rapid pace, in part reflecting lower real disposable income and tighter financial conditions. Activity in the housing sector has weakened significantly, largely reflecting higher mortgage rates. Higher interest rates and slower output growth also appear to be weighing on business fixed investment. As shown in our summary of economic projections, the median projection for real GDP growth stands at just 0.5% this year and next, well below the median estimate of the longer run normal growth rate. Despite the slowdown in growth, the labor market remains extremely tight, with the unemployment rate near a 50 year low, job vacancies still very high, and wage growth elevated. Job gains have been robust, with employment rising by an average of 272,000 jobs per month over the last three months. Although job vacancies have moved below their highs and the pace of job gains has slowed from earlier in the year, the labor market continues to be out of balance, with demand substantially exceeding the supply of available workers. The labor force participation rate is little changed since the beginning of the year. FOMC participants expect supply and demand conditions in the labor market to come into better balance over time, easing upward pressures on wager, wages and prices. The median projection in the SEP for the unemployment rate rises to 4.6% at the end of next year. <clears throat> Inflation remains well above our longer run goal of 2%. Over the 12 months ending in October, total PCE prices rose 6%, Excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 5%. In November, the 12-month change in the CPI was 7.1%, and the change in the core CPI was 6%. The inflation data received so far for October and November show a welcome reduction in the monthly pace of price increases. But it will take substantially more evidence to give confidence that inflation is on a sustained downward path. Price pressures remain evident across a broad range of goods and services. Russia's war against Ukraine has boosted prices for energy and food and has contributed to upward pressure on inflation. 
The median projection in the SEP for total PCE inflation is 5.6% this year and falls 3.1% next year, 2.5% in 2024 and 2.1% in 2025. Participants continue to see risks to inflation as weighted to the upside. Despite elevated inflation, longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a, in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as measure, measures from financial markets. But that is not grounds for complacency. The longer the current bout of high inflation continues, the greater the chance that expectations of higher inflation will become entrenched. Oh, there we go. The Fed's monetary policy means, actions are guided by our no mandate to soon, promote maximum and employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power, especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. We are highly attentive to the risks that high inflation poses to both sides of our mandate and we are strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% objective. <clears throat> At today's meeting, the committee raised the target range for the federal funds rate by a half percentage point, bringing the target range to four and a quarter to four and a half percent. And we are continuing the process of significantly reducing the size of our balance sheet. With today's action, we have raised interest rates by four and a quarter percentage points this year. We continue to anticipate that ongoing increases in the target range for the federal funds rate will be appropriate in order to, to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2% over time. Over the course of the year, financial conditions have tightened significantly in response to our policy actions. Financial conditions fluctuate in the short term in response to many factors, but it is important that over time they reflect the policy restraint that we're putting in place to return inflation to 2%. We are seeing the effects on demand in the most interest sensitive se sectors of the economy, such as housing. It will take time, however, for the full effects of monetary restraint to be realized, especially on inflation. In light of the cumulative tightening of monetary policy and the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, the committee decided to raise interest rates by 50 basis points today, a step down from the 75 basis point pace seen over the previous four meetings. Of course, 50 basis points is still a historically large increase, and we still have some ways to go. As shown in the SEP, the median projection for the appropriate level of the federal funds rate is 5.1% at the end of next year, a half percentage point higher than projected in September. The median projection is 4.1% at the end of 2024 and 3.1% at the end of 2025, still above the median estimate of its longer run value. Of course, these projections do not represent a committee uh, decision or plan, and no one knows with any certainty where the economy will be a year or more from now. Our decisions will depend on the totality of incoming data and their implications for the outlook for economic activity and inflation and we will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting and communicate our thinking as clearly as possible. We are taking forceful steps to moderate demand so that it comes into better alignment with supply. Our overarching focus is using our tools to bring inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keep longer term inflation expectations well anchored. Reducing inflation is likely to require a sustained period of below trend growth and some softening of labor market conditions. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the long run. The historical record cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. We will stay the course until the job is done. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. You don't Everything we care. do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. I should get up on that podium. Thank you. I will look forward to your questions. Smack the hell out of Jerome Powell. Steve Leisman, uh, CNBC. Thanks for taking my question, Mr. Chairman. You just talked about the importance of uh, oh, here market goes conditions uh, reflecting himself. the policy restraint Steve you put in, in, in place. Um, 
since the November meeting, the 10-year has declined by 60 basis points. Mortgage rates have come down. High-yield credit spreads have come in. The economy has accelerated, and uh, the stock market's up 6 percent. Um, is this loosening of financial conditions a problem for the Fed and its effort and its fight against inflation? And if so, do you need to do something about that? And how would you do something about that? Thank you. So as I mentioned, it, it is important that overall financial conditions continue to reflect the policy restraint that we're putting in place to bring inflation down to 2%. Um, we think that financial conditions have tightened significantly in the past year, but our policy actions work through financial conditions and, and those in turn affect, affect economic activity, the labor market and inflation. So what we control is our policy moves and the communications that we make. Financial conditions both anticipate and react to our actions. I would, I would add that our, our focus is not on short-term moves, but on, on uh, persistent moves. Uh, and many, many things, of course, move financial conditions over time. Um, I would say it's our judgment today that we're not at a sufficiently restrictive policy stance yet, which is why we say that we would expect uh, that ongoing hikes would be appropriate. And I would point you to the SCP, again, for uh, our current assessment of what, of what that peak level will be. Uh, as you as you will have seen, uh, 19 people filled out the uh, uh, the SEP this time, and uh, uh, 17 of those 19 wrote down a, a peak rate of 5 percent or more in the fives. So that's our best assessment today for what we think the peak peak rate will be. Uh, you will also know that at, at each subsequent SEP during the course of this year, we've actually increased our estimate of what that peak rate will be. And today, uh, we're, the SCP that we're published shows, again, that overwhelmingly uh, FOMC participants believe that inflation risks are to the upside. So I can't tell you confidently that we won't move up our, our estimate of the peak rate again at the next SCP. I don't know what we'll do. It will depend on future data. What we're writing down today is our best estimate of what we think that, that peak rate will be based on what we know. Obviously, if, data, if the inflation data come in worse, that could move up, if they, and it could move down if uh, inflation data are, are softer. Gina. Gina Smilik, New York Times. Thanks for taking our questions. The SEP, like you mentioned, suggests that the Fed will be making another three-quarter percentage points worth of rate way? increases in 2023. I, I wonder I if you would foresee understand. that being uh, in 25 basis point understand. increments, 50 basis point increments, sort of how you see the speed playing out going forward. And then I wonder what you're looking at as you determine when to stop. Yeah. Um, so, so um, as I've been saying, um, as we've gone through the course of this year, uh, as we lifted off and got into the, the course of the year and we saw the, 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 uh, how strong inflation was and how persistent, it was very important to move quickly. In fact, the speed, the pace with which we were moving was the most important thing. I think now that we're coming to the end of this year, we've raised 425 basis points this year and uh, we're into restrictive territory, it's now not so important how, how fast we go. It's far more important to think what is the ultimate level and then at, at a certain point the question will become how long do we remain restrictive. That will become the most important question. But I would say the most important question now is no longer the speed. So and that that applies to February as well. So I, th I think we'll make the February decision based on the incoming data and and uh, where we see financial conditions where we see the economy um, and that'll be the, the, the key thing. But I mean but for that decision. But Ultimately, um, that question about how high to raise rates is going to be one that we make looking at our progress on inflation, looking at where financial conditions are, and, uh, and making an assessment of whether policy is restrictive enough. I've told you today we have an assessment that, it, that we're not at a restrictive enough stance, even with today's move, and we've laid out our, own, our, our individual assessments of what we would need to do to get there. Um, at a certain point, though, that, that we'll get to that point, and, and then the question will be how long do we stay there, and there, there the, uh, uh, the strong view on the committee is that we'll need to stay there at, you know, until we're really confident that inflation is coming down in a sustained way, and we think that that will be some time. Now, why do I say that? If you look at, look at the, you can break inflation down into, into three sort of buckets. The first is uh, goods inflation, and we see now, as we've been expecting really for a year and a half, that supply conditions would get better. And ultimately, supply chains get fixed, and 
and demand settles down a little bit and maybe goes back to services a little bit and we start to see goods inflation coming down, we're now starting to see that uh, in this report and the last one. Um, then you go to housing services. We know the story there is that uh, housing services uh, inflation has been very, very high and will continue to go up, actually, um, uh, as, as, rate, as, rents, as, as rents expire and have to be renewed. They're going to be renewed into a, into a market where rates are higher than they were when the, when the original leases were signed. But we see that the new leases that are, that, that, that the rate for new leases is coming down. So once we work our way through that backlog, that, that inflation will come down sometime next year. The third piece, which is something like 55% of the index, PCE and uh, core inflation index, is non-housing related uh, core services. And that's really a function of the labor market largely at the biggest cost by far in that sector is labor. And we, you know, we do see a very, very strong labor market. One where we haven't seen much softening, where job growth is very high, where wages are very high, vacancies are, are quite elevated, and really there's an imbalance in the labor market between supply and demand. So that part of it, which is the biggest part, is likely to take a substantial period to get down. The other, the, you know, the, the goods inflation has turned pretty quickly now after not turning at all for a year and a half. Now it seems to be turning. But um, there's an expectation really that the, that the, uh, the services inflation will, will not move down so quickly so that we'll have to stay at it so that we may have to raise rates higher to get to where we want to go. And that's really why we are writing down those high rates and why we're expecting that they'll have to remain high for a time. Uh, Howard Schneider with Reuters. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, you described uh, GDP growth in the SEPs as uh, moderate or, or modest, I believe, um, yet it's really approaching stall speed. Half a percentage point is not much. Uh, you described uh, labor market unemployment rate as uh, representing some softening, but it's nearly a full percentage point rise, and that's well in excess of what has historically been associated with recession. Uh, why wouldn't this be considered a recessionary uh, projection by the Fed? Well, <clears throat> I, I'll tell you what the projection is. <clears throat> I, I don't think it would qualify as a recession, though, no, because you've got positive growth. The, the expectations in the SEP are basically, as you said, which is we've got growth at a, at a modest level, which is to say about a half a percentage point. That's positive growth. It's slow growth. It's well below trend. It's not going to feel like a boom. It's going to feel like s very slow growth, right? Um, in, that, in that condition, Labor market conditions are softening a bit. Unemployment does go up a bit. I would say that many uh, analysts believe that the, that the natural rate of unemployment is actually elevated at this moment. So it's not clear that, that, that those forecasts of inflation are, are really much above the natural rate of unemployment. We, we can never identify its location with great precision. But that 4.7% is, is still a strong labor market. If you look, you know, you've got the reports we get from the field are that uh, Companies are very reluctant to lay people off. Other than the tech companies, which is a, you know a story unto itself, generally companies want to hold on to the workers they have because it's been very very hard to hire. So and you've got all these vacancies out there, far in excess of the number of employed people. That doesn't sound like a you know a labor market where a lot of people will need to be put out of work. So that we you know there there are channels through which the labor market can come back into balance with, with relatively modest uh, increases in unemployment, we believe. None of that is guaranteed, but that, uh, that is what their forecast reflects. Nick. <clears throat> Thanks, Nick Timoros of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Chair Powell, I want to follow up on, on Gina's question. The decision to step down the pace of rate increase, rate rises, uh, appears to have been socialized at your last meeting, largely before the past two CPI reports showed inflation decelerating in line with the committee's forecast this year. You just now talked about making decisions meeting by meeting and being mindful of the lags of policy. Does that mean all things equal, you would feel more comfortable probing where the terminal rate is by moving in 25 basis point increments, including beginning at your next meeting? So I, I haven't made a judgment <clears throat> on what size rate hike to, to make at the last meeting. But you know, the, what, what you said is broadly right, which is having moved so quickly and having now so much restraint that's still in the pipeline, we think that the appropriate thing to do now is to move to a slower pace. And um, you know, that, will, that will allow us to feel our way and, 
uh, you know, and get to that level, we think, and, and better balance the risks that we face. So that, that's, that's the idea. It makes, makes a lot of sense, it seems to me, particularly if you, if you consider how far we've come. Um, I, but again, I, I can't tell you today what the, what the actual size of that will be. It will depend on, on a, a variety of factors, including the incoming data in particular, the state of the economy, the state of financial conditions. With the CPI report, if it had come out last week, do you think it would have changed uh, some of those, those forecasts in, in today's SEP? No, absolutely not. <clears throat> no, uh, as, a, as a, just a matter of practice, the SEP reflects any data that's that comes out during the meeting and participants know that they have the they know this that they they can make changes to their SEP during the meeting you know well in advance of the press conference so that we're not running around but that's not the case it's never the case that 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 the SEPs don't reflect an important piece of data that came in on the first day of the meeting Hi, Chair Powell, Rachel Siegel from the Washington Post. Thank you for taking our questions. I'm wondering if we could talk about the projection for the unemployment rate. Why has the Fed raised its unemployment projection? Is it because the model suggests that a higher terminal rate would automatically cause a higher unemployment rate? Or are you seeing signs that the labor market isn't quite as strong as we think it is now? Thanks. No, it's not about the strength of the labor market. The labor market is, is clearly very strong. It, it is more just that, um, you know, by now, we had expected, we've continually expected to make faster progress on inflation than, than we have, ultimately. And that's why, the, that's why the, uh, the peak rate for this year goes up between this meeting and the September meeting. You see, that, you see the fact that we've made less progress than expected on inflation. So that's why that goes up. And that's why unemployment goes up, because we're having to tighten policy more. And so it didn't go up by much in, in the meeting, I don't think, but, but that's, that's the idea, is slower progress on inflation, tighter policy, probably higher rates, probably held for longer, uh, just, to, just to get to where you, the kind of uh, uh, restriction that you need to get inflation down to 2%. Do you have a sense of, in order to get to that number, how much of that could be caused by layoffs versus vacancies trimming or changes to the labor force population rate? So it's, it's very hard to say. Um, you know, there, you, can look at, you can look at history, right? And history would, you know, would say that uh, in a situation like this, the declines in unemployment would be more meaningful, I think, than, than what you see written down there. But why do we think that is the case? So I'll give you a few reasons. First just is that there, there's this huge overhang of vacancies, meaning that, that vacancies can come down a fair amount. And we're hearing from many companies that they don't want to lay people off so that they'll keep people because it's been so hard. I mean, I think we, we've, it feels like we have a structural labor shortage out there where there are you know, 4 million fewer people, a little more than 4 million, who are in the workforce available to work than there's demand for workforce. So the fact that there's a strong labor market you know, means that, that, uh, that, that companies will hold on to workers, and it means that it may take longer, but it also means that the, that the costs in unemployment may be less. Again, that we're going to find out empirically, but I think... That's a, that's a reasonably uh, possible outcome, and you do hear, you know, many, many uh, labor economists believe that it is. So we'll see, though. Colby. Thank you. Colby Smith with the Financial Times. How should we interpret the higher core inflation forecast for 2023 uh, in the SEP? Uh, does that not then suggest that the policy rate currently forecasted for next year should actually be higher than the 5.1 uh, medium estimate penciled in? Well, I think that's why it w one of the reasons it went up was that core came in stronger this year, came in stronger this year. Yeah, what, what you see is, is our best estimate as of today, really, as of today, for how high we need to, to, to raise rates, to how, how much we need to tighten policy to create enough uh, you know, restrictive policy to slow economic activity and slow, soften the labor market and bring inflation down through those channels. That's, that's all you, that, that's, that is the estimate, uh, best estimate we make today. And uh, as I mentioned, we'll make another estimate for the next SEP. And we'll, you know, of course, between meetings, we do the same thing, but we don't publish it. Um, hi, Victoria Guido with Politico. Um, I, I wanted to make sure I understand specifically um, what's going on in the SCP because you all expect rates to go higher, but you're also more pessimistic about 
what inflation is going to look like next year. And I was just wondering, you know, given that we have seen some cooling in inflation, uh, you know, is it is that primarily because of wage growth that you expect wage growth to be sort of a, a, a headwind? No, we're, we're going into next year with higher inflation than we had thought. Right. So we're actually moving down to uh, the level that we're moving down to next year is still a very large drop in inflation from where inflation is running now. Well, more than a one percent change in inflation. But remember that the, the jump off point at the beginning of the year is higher. So, it, you know, we we're, we're moving down still by a very large chunk. I don't think it's having I don't think the policy is having any less effect. It's just starting from a higher level at the end of 2022. So we're getting down. I believe the median is three and a half percent. That would be that's a pretty significant drop in inflation. Um, and, you know, where's it coming from? It's coming from it's coming from the goods sector, clearly. Um, by the middle of next year, we should begin to see uh, uh, lower inflation from the uh, the housing services sector. And then, you know, the, the big question is when we how much will you see from the largest, the 55 percent of the index, which is the non housing services uh, sector. And, you know, that's that's where you need to see we believe you need to see uh, a, you know, a, a better balancing of supply and demand in the labor market so that you have it's it's not that we don't want wage increases we want strong wage increases we we just want them to be at a level that's consistent with 2% inflation right now the, if you if you put into if you factor in productivity estimates standard productivity estimates wages are running you know well above what would be consistent with 2% inflation Neil. thanks Hi, Chair Powell. Uh, Neil, <clears throat> Neil Irwin with Axios. Uh, some of your colleagues have been pretty explicit that they can't imagine rate cuts happening in 2023. Uh, that's certainly not implied by, by the SEP. Uh, but futures markets have priced in some easing in the back half of next year. Uh, what's, what's your view of the likelihood of any kind of rate cuts next year? Now, what circumstances is a, might make that possible? This is a great question right here. You know, our, <clears throat> our focus right now <clears throat> is, is really on moving our policy stance to one that is restrictive enough to uh, assure a return of inflation to our 2% uh, goal over time. It's not on rate cuts. Um, and we think that we'll have to maintain a restrictive stance of policy for some time. Historical experience cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. I guess I, I would say it this way. I, I, I wouldn't see us considering rate cuts until the committee is confident that inflation is moving down to 2% in a sustained way. 2%. So that's, that's, the, that's the test I would articulate. Wow, and, and you're correct, there, there are not rate cuts uh, in, in, uh, in the SEP for 2023. That should tank the market. Steve. <clears throat> Steve Matthews with Bloomberg. Uh, let me ask you about uh, China. In the last few weeks, uh, China has abandoned its uh, COVID policy and been reopening pretty strongly. I'm wondering if you see that as disinflationary because you're seeing supply <laughs> chains new one improve hour candle, or inflationary uh, because it obviously brings a lot a more minutes, demand so globally, improves the global outlook for growth now. and uh, for commodities prices. And so you're, you're right. Those two things will offset each other. Weaker, weaker output in China will, will push down on commodity prices, but it could interfere with supply chains ultimately, and that could that could push inflation up in the West. It's very hard to say, you know, how much uh, how those two will offset each other. And, and it doesn't seem likely, actually, that the overall net effect would be material on us. But to your point, China faces a very challenging situation in, in reopening. And we, you know, we've seen uh, waves of COVID all around the world can interfere with economic activity. China, a very critical manufacturing uh, place for manufacturing and exporting. Their supply chain is very important. Um, and uh, China faces a reopening. They've, you know, they've backed away from their COVID restriction policies. There could be very significant increases in COVID, and we'll just have to see. It's a risky situation. It, but again, it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's likely to have material overall effects on us. Chris, hi, uh, Chris Rugaber at Associated Press. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, I wondered, I wondered if you could comment a bit more about yesterday's inflation report. I mean, it showed inflation cooling in all three of the categories that you laid out at Brookings. Are you starting to see, are you confident that you're seeing real progress on getting inflation under control? Uh, it, are you still worried it could slip into some kind of uh, unentrenched, you know, upward spiral? Thank you. Right. So <clears throat> the data that we've received so far for October and November, we don't have the uh, some of the 
we have some remaining data to get in November, but they, they clearly do show a, a welcome reduction in the monthly pace of price increases. As I mentioned in my opening statement, it will take substantially more evidence to give confidence that inflation is on a sustained downward path. So the way we think about this uh, is this. This report is very much in line with what we've been expecting and hoping for. And what it does is it, it provides greater confidence in our forecast of declining inflation. As I mentioned, we've been expecting significant forecasting significant declines in, infl in overall inflation and core inflation in the coming year. And this is the kind of reading that it will take to, to support that. So really, this gives us greater confidence in our forecast rather than at, at this point cha changing our forecast. Um, in, ter in terms of the pieces, we have been expecting goods inflation to come down as supply chain pressures eased. That's happening now. Housing services, as I mentioned, there is good news in the pipeline. As long as housing, new housing leases show declining inflation, that will show up in the measure around the middle of next year, so that should help. And the big piece, again, is core services X housing, which is very important, and we, we, have, we have a ways to go there. You, you do see some beginning signs there, but ultimately that's, that's the big, that more than half, as I mentioned, of, of PCE core index. And... Uh, it's, it's very uh, fundamentally about the labor market and, uh, and wages. If you look at wages, look at the average hourly earnings number we got with the, um, the last uh, 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 payrolls report, you don't really see much progress in terms of our average hourly earnings coming down. Now, there, there may be composition effects and other effects in that, so we don't put, we don't put too much weight on any one report. These things can be volatile month to month. But we be, we'll be looking for wages moving you know, down to more normal levels where workers are doing well and, and ultimately their gains are not being eaten up by inflation. Michael McKee. There's a, <coughs> excuse me, Michael McKee from Bloomberg Radio and Television. Um, there's a little bit of a disconnect between the optimistic view you just expressed about the economy and the changes that you've made in the SEP. Uh, and I'm wondering if you're reacting to uh, the fact that the markets have loosened financial conditions or if you feel the Fed may be a little bit behind on inflation, uh, whether in the, the recent disinflation we're seeing is transitory or not, uh, and how this affects the idea of a soft landing if you're projecting just half a percent growth for this year. So if, if, I, if I, I think I got your question. So, you know, one thing is to say is I think our policies in getting into a pretty good place now, we're restrictive, and I think we're, you know, we're, we're getting close to that level of sufficient, we think, uh, sufficiently restrictive. We laid out today what our best estimates are um, uh, to get there. Um, and, uh, I mean, it boils down to how long do we think this process is going to take. And, of course, we're, we welcome these, these, uh, these better inflation reports for the last two months. They're very welcome, but I think we're realistic about the broader project. So that, that's all, uh, th that's the point I would make. It's, you know, we, we see... Goods prices coming down. We understand what will happen with uh, housing services, but the big story will really be the, the rest of it, and there's not much progress there, and that's going to take some time. I, th I think my view and my colleagues' view is that this will take some time. We'll have to hold policy at a restrictive level for a sustained period, so that you know two good you know two good re uh, re monthly reports are you know very welcome. Of course, they're very welcome, but I think we need to be honest with ourselves that there's you know inflation. 12-month core inflation is 6% CPI. That's three times our 2% uh, target. Now, it's, it's good to see progress, but let's just understand we have a long ways to go to get back to price stability. Well, do you think the, uh, the soft landing is no longer achievable? No, I wouldn't say that. No, I, I don't say that. I mean, I, I would say this. Um, How is a you know, soft landing To the extent possible? we need to keep Come rates higher now. and keep them there uh -huh. for longer and inflation you know, moves up higher and higher. I think that that narrows the runway. But lower inflation readings, if they persist in time, could could certainly make it more possible. So I, I just I don't think anyone knows uh, whether we're going to have a recession or not. And if we do, whether it's going to be a deep one or not, it's just it's not knowable. And um, certainly, uh, you know, lower inflation reports, were they to continue for a period of time, would would increase the likelihood of of a. So I would put it this way, of a, of a 
a return to price stability that involves significantly less uh, less of an increase in unemployment than would be expected given the historical record. Right. Hi, Chairman Powell. Uh, uh, hi, Chairman Powell. Brian Chung, NBC News. Um, you warned Americans of pain earlier this year as the Fed hikes rates, but with the Fed now expected to raise rates higher than you thought when you first said that, just wondering where we are in that pain. How would you describe that to Americans if the projections on unemployment find themselves? That would be 1.6 million Americans out of jobs. So the, <clears throat> the largest amount of pain, the worst pain would come from a failure to raise rates high enough and from a, us allowing inflation to become entrenched in the economy so that the ultimate cost of, of getting it out of the economy would be very high in, ter in terms of uh, employment, meaning very high unemployment for extended periods of time, the kind of thing that had to happen when inflation really got out of control and the Fed didn't respond aggressively enough or soon enough in, in a prior episode, you know, 50 years ago. So that's really the, the worst pain would be if we failed to act. What we're doing now is, you know, it's raising interest rates for people. And so people are paying higher rates on mortgages and that kind of thing. Um, there will be some softening in labor market conditions. And I wish there were a completely painless way to restore price stability. There isn't. And uh, this is the best we can do. I, 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 do, I do think, though, that uh, um, and markets are, are pretty confident, it seems to me, that we will get inflation under control. And, and I believe we will. We're certainly highly committed to do that. Grady. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Grady Trimble with Fox Business. Um, you've reiterated today, and the committee has reiterated its commitment to that 2% inflation target. Uh, I wonder, is there ever a point where you actually reevaluate that target and maybe increase your inflation target if it is stickier than even you think it is? That's that's just uh, so changing our inflation goal is just something we're not we're not thinking about. It's not something we're not going to think about. It's it, we have a two percent inflation goal, and we'll use our tools to get inflation back to two percent. I think this isn't the time to be thinking about that. I mean, there may be a longer run project at some point, uh, but that is not where we are at all. The committee we're not considering that. We're not going to consider that uh, under any circumstances. We're gonna we're gonna keep our inflation target at two percent. We're gonna use our tools to get inflation back to two percent. Nicole. Thank you, Chairman Powell. Nicole Goodkind, CNN Business. Uh, as you monitor wage growth and unemployment data, I wonder if you're paying close attention to a sector or even income level. Like, How do you factor uh, potential exacerbations of inequality into your risk calculations, especially given the K-shaped recovery of 2020? So the, um, I, I would go back to the labor market that we had in 2018, 19, 20. So what that looked like was wage increases for the people at the lowest end of the income spectrum were the largest. The gaps between, uh, between racial groups and gender groups were at their smallest in recorded history. Um, that's, and that, all of that because of a tight labor market. A tight labor market, which which had inflation running, you know, just a tick below two percent, and the economy growing right at what at its potential. So that seems like uh, something that would be really good for the economy and for the country if we could get back to that. And so that's what all of us want to do. We want to get back to us to uh, a long expansion where the labor market can remain strong over an extended period of time. That's a really good thing for workers in the economy, and we'd love to get back to that. That's what our goal is. Um, you know, there's, in, in the near term, w we have to use our tools to restore price stability, but we, you know, we can't, w what we have to think about is the medium and longer term. If you think about it, the country went through a difficult time, I think, much more difficult than we can, can think it would happen here, but it really set up our economy for several decades of prosperity. So price stability is, is something that really pays dividends for the benefit of the economy and the people in it over a very, very long period of time. And so when it is lost, for whatever reason, it has to be restored and as quickly as possible, which is what we're doing. In, in the short term, are you factoring in these exacerbate or potential exacerbations in the policy? Are you monitoring? We do. Yes, we, we absolutely do. We, we look at, um, 
it's our regular practice to talk about unemployment rates by different uh, different groups, including racial groups and, and that sort of thing. We do. We keep our eye on that. Nancy. Racial groups. Hi, Nancy Marshall Genser with Marketplace. Um, what would you do if the economy slows so much that we enter a recession before we see strong, consistent signs that inflation is slowing? In other words, stagflation. So I, I don't want to get t into too many hypotheticals, but um, you know, we'll, we'll, we, it's, hard, it's hard to deal with hypotheticals. So let me just say that we have to use our tools to support maximum employment and price stability. Uh, I've made it clear that right, right now the labor market's very, very strong. You're at a, near a 50-year low. Um, where you're at or above maximum employment, um, in 50-year low in unemployment. Vacancies are very high. Wages, nominal wages are very high. So the labor market is very, very strong. Where we're missing is on the inflation side. And we're missing by a lot on the inflation side. So that means we need to really focus on getting inflation under control. And that's what we'll do. I think as the economy heals, the two, the two goals come more into, into, uh, into play. But right now, clearly the focus has to be on getting inflation down. Thank you, Chairman Powell. Greg Robb from Market Watch. You, you spoke a little bit ago. You said that the U.S. looks. You, it looks like we have a structural labor shortage in the economy. Could you expand on that? Talk a little bit more about that. And really, are you talking about um, getting Congress action on uh, inc increasing like legal immigration, things like that? Thank you. So what uh, what I meant by that, the structural labor shortage, is if you, if you look at um, where we are now, as I mentioned. Um, uh, there, if you just look at demand for labor, you can you can look at vacancies plus people who are actually working, and then you can take supply of labor by are you in the labor market? Are you are you wor looking for a job or have a job? And you're four, more than four million people short. Um, we don't see, uh, despite very high wages and an incredibly tight labor market, we don't see participation moving up, which is contrary to what we thought. So the the the, the upshot of all that is, the labor market is actually. It should, it's three and a half million than it should have been based on assume population and reasonable. Our labor force should be three and a half million um, more than it is. And that it can, there, there are easy, lots of easy ways to get to bigger numbers than that if you go back a few more years. So why is that? Part of it is just uh, accelerated retirements. People dropped out and aren't coming back at a, at a higher rate than expected. Part of it is that we lost a half a million people who would have been work close to a half a million who would have been working uh, who died from COVID, um, and and part of it is that migration has been lower. We don't prescribe, you know, we're, we're, it's not our job to prescribe things. But I, you know, I think if you if you ask businesses, uh, you know, pretty much everybody you talk to says we there aren't enough people. We we need more people. So we, I, I tried to identify that in my in, in a speech I gave a month ago, but I but I stopped short of of telling Congress what to do because, you know, they gave us a job and we need to, you know, do that job. Thanks. Jennifer? Thank you, Chair Powell. Jennifer Schoenberger with Yahoo Finance. Uh, you say you expect growth of just half a percent next year, uh, given that you've said the process of raising rates and getting inflation back under control will be painful. <clears throat> have you had discussions within the committee and addressed how long and or how deep of a recession you would be willing to accept? No. I mean, we, what we do is we make, we make our forecasts um, and we publish them quarterly. And, you know, if you, if you look at those forecasts, those are, those are forecasts for slow growth, uh, for a softening labor market, by which I mean unemployment goes up, but, but not a great deal. And you see inflation coming down. You see rates going up a lot. You see inflation coming down. Th those are those forecasts. And that, that's, that's really what they show. We're not, um, I, you know, we, we all, of course, we, we don't, um, Talk about uh, you know this kind of a, of, a, of a of a recession and that kind of a recession. We just we you know we make those forecasts. The staff runs, and you you will see this if you look at the old Teal books, runs uh, alternative simulations of all different kinds, 
at every meeting, and we look at those too. And those will explore different things. But that's just, uh, you know, upside and downside scenarios. Of course, that's responsible practice that we've carried on for, for many decades. But no, we don't, um, we haven't asked ourselves that question. We'll go to Gene for the last question. Hi, Jean Young with Market News. Um, I wanted to ask a, about the SCP again. If you are reaching peak rates around 5% in the first half of next year and inflation starts to decline materially, that would seem to make the real rate um, gradually more restrictive. Is that something that's built into the projections and, and into models? Is that something you would want to see? So we, we do know that, of course. That's something that, that we know and we'd see. But as I mentioned, that, you know, we wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, um, see the committee cutting rates until we're confident that inflation is moving down in a sustained way. Uh, that, that would be my test. I, I, I don't see us as having a really clear and precise understanding of what, of what the neutral rate is and what real rates are, so that it would mechanically happen like that. It would really, it'll be a test of, uh, for cutting rates, I think, in, in the event, it'll be a question of, do we actually feel confident that inflation is coming down in a sustained way? Thank you very much. <clears throat> that is the Fed Chair, Jay Powell. Rapp no cap, no cap, no cap, no cap. Fuck it! Do it live! I can I'll write it and we'll do it live! Okay. Ready? Right. Fucking thing sucks! We'll do it live. Okay. All right, ladies and gents, there you have it. Another FOMC under our belts. And an absolute nothing burger, man. This guy, I tell you, let me show you the accuracy of the Fed in the last 15 years. I, I swear, I got a perfect chart. It shows the dot plot of the Fed's accuracy. Uh, it's hit rate and uh, let me see if I can pull it up this is an official chart here guys uh, so bear with me I'm just trying to load this up here and here we go yep that is the Federal Reserve ever since I started paying attention to them back in 08 I mean the accuracy is phenomenal the form is great it is they talk a lot they talk a lot of shit but <laughs> boy oh boy they hit nothing but backboard. Nothing but back. And then occasionally hit the pole up there, you see? So, again, you can't, you really can't. You just got to do the opposite of whatever they say. I tell you, man, it's just, it doesn't make, the, it makes no sense. Daniel Parker said, in the Fed, let free markets reign. Inflation is central bank's theft. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So Red River says next meeting is not until February 1st. Uh, thanks for tuning in and dropping that that fact for us, Red River. I really appreciate you tuning in. But yeah, man, uh, so we wrapped up for the year. Uh, we won't see anything, hear anything from Powell officially until February 1st. So, hey, man, uh, it is what it is. I guess the markets will now just be able to move on autopilot. I don't know if we're going to have a Santa rally. Santa, Santa dresses in red. Just to let everyone know. They, he doesn't dress in green. So I don't know. You know, this Santa rally. What, what are we talking about here? Crypto City said, I don't even think they reached the backboard. You're right. It may be a whole bunch of air balls. It may be a whole bunch of air balls for sure. So uh, I had a couple of um, articles I wanted to go over. Because, you know, as you guys know, Sam Bankman fraud. He's been arrested. Okay, he's in custody, and that story is ever changing and evolving, so I want to keep you guys up to 
update on that. I also want to talk about Binance because there are some things going on, some rumblings. $3 billion has left Binance Exchange in the last seven days. Let me say that again. $3 billion in the last seven days. I don't care if you were a legitimate running business exchange. That is going to hurt you. Because we all know exchanges don't stay in business or go into business to just simply hold your money and do nothing with it. But exchange and make a little spread off the off the ask bid and a little exchange fees or whatever. That's not, <laughs> they don't go into business for that. They go into business to take your money and do something with it and make more money, right? In addition to the ask bid, market making and all of that, of course, that's part of it. But primarily the money is in taking your money and going out and doing something with it. So we know that Binance has liabilities. Uh, probably more than what they have on the books as assets. That's just normal. It's not like this a Ponzi scheme or anything like that. So when you have three Billy leave your books, that is a problem. And so... Why are people leaving the book, leaving Binance? We don't know yet. We do know that U.S. prosecutors are saying they have enough to, you know, bring charges against CZ. Will he ever come to court? Will he ever? No. Nah. If Doquan never makes it, what makes you think CZ, the richest man in crypto, is really going to come to the United States? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So anyhow, we're going to take a look at uh, that um, and and just kind of summarize FTX because there are some more things coming out on that as well. So let's start with CNBC. As you guys can see here, Binance CEO says deposits are coming back, quote unquote, but sees bumpy road ahead for the crypto firm. I'm glad he's being semi-transparent there, but I'm a little concerned. I'm actually consulting with a crypto fund here. Uh, in, in, in the state and they want to use uh, some of my systematic trading techniques and you know I'm just consulting with them on that and I could, thank God I got them to take their money off FTX.us before that went down and we were looking to move funds over to Binance and thank God that is not happening as swiftly as we wanted it to because who knows what the hell is going on with Binance its future. I don't like I, I just don't know. And if Binance goes down, oh my goodness, Elmo, where are you? Like <laughs> that we are going to visit Elmo even quicker. So that is uh a concern for me. You know, hearing this type type of news is very concerning to me that Binance has a rough few months ahead because of the withdrawals. 3 Billy in the last seven days. <clears throat> now the withdrawals, um, the withdrawals that took place on Tuesday were just alone. Tuesday were 1.14 billion net withdrawals. So they had to pause on them draws, <laughs> like Bitcoin Zay said. They had to pause on them draws and uh, get things in order. Then they did resume withdrawals for USDC which was the uh, stable coin in question. And that is good news. I said that yesterday. I did say that yesterday. Now, the guy from the blockchain uh, analytics firm, Nansen, said on Tuesday that there have been more than $3 billion in net withdrawals from Binance over the last seven days. But he says that this situation is definitely different than FTX, which saw withdrawals to the tune of multi-billion of dollars now three billion is multi billions okay let's just start there <laughs> but maybe he meant multi tens of billions the guy from Nansen said I would say that you're definitely seeing larger than normal withdrawals from Binance and it is definitely worth keeping an eye on but as far as I can tell at this point in time this is different than FTX's situation all right so, CZ goes on to say, we, uh, while we expect the next several months to be bumpy, we will get past this challenging period 
and will be stronger for having been through it. See, I don't like those types of quotes. I don't like, so they're definitely having some liquidity issues. Now, who would have thought? Who would have thought? Here we are. This is where we stand. And honestly, a lot of this stems from SBF, which is crazy to even think. But uh, yeah, not a good look for Binance. So please be careful. I don't see them going under. I just don't. They are the last ones to stand. And if they go under, it is a problem. Funds are Safu, says Juan Fitty. Thank you for tuning in, Juan Fitty, a.k.a. 10 Pound. Crypto City said, CZ said it's business as usual and a little run on exchange is good for exchanges. I don't know if it's good for exchanges, but I, my gut feeling, Crypto Domus's gut feeling is that Binance is okay. But it is a little concerning to hear that he's saying this. At least he's being transparent. At least he's being transparent. I will have to say that. So uh, that is what's going on with Binance at the moment. Binance CEO tells staff next week, next few months will be bumpy, as I stated in the other one. This is from Decrypt Media. In a message seen on Bloomberg, the CEO said that despite a lot of extra scrutiny and tough questions that have emerged after the collapse of rival exchange, FTX, he expects his firm will get past this challenging period. Okay, he pointed to a recent intense examination that many firms are facing, calling this a historic moment, but said that Binance is built to last. And I, I have to agree with him. I do. He's been running a pretty tight ship since he started, to be honest with you. Uh, so there it is. But he, he, here's one thing I wanted to show you guys. I, this... <laughs> You can't make this shit up, ladies and gentlemen. You you can't make this shit up. Listen to this. So uh, <laughs> evidently, uh, th and this goes back to CZ and your boy SBF. Evidently, they were in a secret private signal group. Okay. And I didn't even know about, no one knew about this really. But essentially, execs, at top exchanges all had a group called exchange coordination on signal cz was in there sbf is in there even kraken's founder jesse powell's in there tether cto was in there so you got the heavy hitters of the crypto space all in this signal group okay the signal group's chat logs were apparently seen by wall street journal and high up crypto execs like tether's cto and Kraken's co-founder, Jesse Powell, are purportedly members of this group. So, Wall Street Journal reported details that SBF was accused of trying to destabilize stablecoins. And more specifically, Tether. A Tether official and the head of the world's largest crypto exchange grew alarmed that SBF was trying to destabilize the stablecoin. What? Are you serious? I'm thoroughly confused. There is no way this guy isn't doing some time, ladies and gentlemen. And now, <laughs> the more I see come out about his behavior, the more I think he's going to get a little bit more time than I initially said he would. I'm just being honest, guys. I think he's going to get a lot more time than five years, which was my first gut check on as far as time which was a light it would be a light sentence it would be a light sentence at five years uh however in the statement made by wall street journal sbf denied the claims made in the report about the signal chat conversation now why would cz why would powell why would anyone else lie about this so it seems that Binance CEO, CEO CZ confronted SBF about the alleged depegging attempts, quoting, stop trying to depeg stablecoins, CZ is cited as saying, and stop doing anything. Stop now. Don't cause more damage. <laughs> this is crazy. This is crazy. So, as if that didn't 
cause an alarm or more confusion about this guy. Now it's been said that uh, FTX Inner Circle had a group chat, secret group chat, called Wire Fraud. Yes, you can't make this shit up, ladies and gents. Wire Fraud. I can't read the whole uh, report here or article. But essentially, members of the Inner Circle of Power uh, formed a chat called Wire Fraud and were using it to send secret information about operations in the lead up to the company's spectacular failure. Again, more evidence to me, guys, that SBF is going to be doing more than just five years. He might be doing 10 plus. I'm not going to lie. He may be doing a little bit more time. There's just there's too much damning evidence against him uh, to say this is just he didn't know. He didn't have oversight. He was not perv uh, privy to all the inners, inner workings of S FTX. No. And Alameda. No, sir. No, sir. -y. USDC withdrawals need to go to a bank in NYC and their bank was closed. Right. Yeah. Yep, yep, that's exactly what was reported yesterday. I covered that yesterday, buddy. So you're exactly right on that. Damn, Doquan was telling the truth. Yeah, Doquan, listen. This is crazy because uh, real life is sometimes stranger than fiction. The truth is sometimes stranger than fiction. Doquan really could have been the victim here. Can you believe that? So, Lee Vio says, F SBF, I don't trust people that with that haircut is like a sheep slaps on his head all the time. A sheep sleeps on his head all the time. Mon F said, no exchange can be profitable off fees alone, especially if they're market and sponsor arenas. Exactly. You're spot on, Mon. You're spot on. So, there has to be some level of risk taking with the assets that are deposited on that exchange so when you start seeing a run on the bank or run on the exchange there is cause for concern but again secret inner circle chat room called wire fraud of all labels names you could have came up with you come up with wire fraud like come on the hubris the hubris ladies and gentlemen i'm just like <laughs> shreggy i couldn't believe it wire fraud Really? Good God Almighty. Lastly, I wanted to talk about the proceedings that happened uh, in the Bahamas with SBF. Yes, he was denied bail, thank God. But what was more interesting is that his parents attended the hearing. Uh, not that his parents were attended the hearing, that his parents were laughing, sticking their fingers in their ears, all types of weird stuff going on, maybe out of uh, nerves or being nervous and anxious but not good on optics I'll tell you that much at the hearing which largely focused on whether Bankman would be released on bail the former FTX CEO indicated that he was not waiving his right to challenge his extradition to the US CoinDesk reporter said so the site was there on live in Nassau all right when the news broke but during the proceedings, this is what's interesting. Bankman Freed's mother, Barbara Fraud, laughed when her son was called a fugitive. Um, yeah, which described his parents as showing both dejection and defiance. She also clenched her jaw and chewed on the frames of her glasses. His father, on the other hand, occasionally put his fingers in his ears as if to drown out the sound of the proceedings. Hell, oh, wow. This is optically is just horrible. After the hearing, which ended with Bankman fraud being denied bail. Let's go ahead and uh, round of applause for, for that. But thank God that didn't happen. Both Freed and Bankman are on the faculty of Stanford Law School. Man. So... Uh, this is interesting. This is interesting. Uh, and optically just not a good look. Not a good look, ladies and gents. Uh, 
But hey, it is what it is. Just wanted to give you guys an update on that. Um, let's see what Mr. B said. Word is the media is trying to downplay how much money was given to the Pinocchio Joe family. So he can pay back less. Yeah, I'm sure. But, you know, in the article that I just showed you, the secret group wire fraud that, fraud that FTX created, just lets, lets you know and lets me know that uh, more than SBF will be going down. This is not, listen, more, more heads will roll within the inner circle of FTX. So, it is what it is. Rand said, I just want to know if the guy is a Freemason. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> I don't think so. Look at his hair. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, this is uh, this is crazy. Cryptophagia says, FTX falling short on its commitment to provide 100%, or 100 formerly incarcerated Chicagoans with no fee bank accounts and guaranteed monthly income. Well, I didn't know about this. When asked, FBOD said this, that it was more important to give those funds to his one son for legal fees than provide it to a program that would help 100. I mean, hey, when when resources are limited, I think I'm going to help my son too. I'm just going to be honest with you there. I'm not, that doesn't uh, surprise me at all. I think I would do the same thing. But uh, hey, it is what it is, guys. I thank you for tuning in and make sure before you leave you jump on that stage smack that thumbs up okay help out the algo we got 43 people still left in the building this was another episode of off the chain that was episode number 90 with yours truly crypto blood i'm out of here holla Surfing through the city while them chips rise. Hot boy, hot boy, do it big time. LMA with my summer bay, we booed up. Cali hit the bay, we fly MIA, we booed up. Sipping on this drink, bitch, I know the way. We used up. Nigga, violate till it's JFK like your roof up. Coin daddy about them chips, nigga, rap. Face all in a box, nigga, snap. Fucking with the ops to get you clapped. Up. No cap, no cap, nigga, rap. rap. Fuck it! Do it live! I can I'll write it and we'll do it live! Okay. Ready? Fucking thing sucks. We'll do it live. Okay.